in response to the request I've had for a video specifically talking about disorganized attachment. Now I've talked a lot about it in regard to borderline childhoods, although a disorganized attachment style is certainly not the only reason why a person may have BPD. There can be genetic and hereditary roots, unresolved trauma and trauma. There's, it's really a complicated dynamic. But when we think about disorganized attachment, I often use this example when we think about what experience a child might have with a parent, especially an untreated borderline parent who may often be dealing with their disorder, their own unresolved trauma, dissociation, difficulty in um, you know, regulating emotions with identity and relationships in general. So in this video though, we're just gonna talk about what the classic disorganized attachment experience looks like. Now really quickly, I'm Dr. Kim Sage. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I hope you'll consider subscribing and clicking the bell and that way you'll get notified when I post new videos. Now, let me just say that if you want to watch more videos on attachment, you can check out these videos here. But remembering that attachment is generally the way that we engage with our primary caregivers and sort of the map or template that sets up sort of for you know what love looks like, what security looks like. Can I rely on people? Can I not? Am I more independent? Am I not? Am I safe? Am I not? It goes into all of those issues, which I also discussed before. But the hallmark of disorganized attachment is different from our other three styles, which are secure, insecure avoidant or insecure dismissing and insecure anxious. Now we can often see within disorganized attachment this sort of range of insecurity to um, some from the avoidant end to the anxious end and sort of all over the map. But in the early research there were initially a cannot classify group of babies that were found to be displaying these sort of chaotic um, attachment patterns and even within that dynamic, there, there can be some organization within the disorganization, but initially they were, you know, unclassified. And so when you read a lot of books like Wired for Love and Dating for Love, a lot of the classic self-help books for non-therapy individuals, non-therapist individuals, I should say, we don't often hear about disorganized attachment. And I think it's a shame because as I keep saying, I truly believe that there is such a wide population, both men and women, who have struggled and struggle with disorders like borderline, who often remain undiagnosed. And because the, their deep need to be in relationship can sometimes and often mean that the love can be good, but can also be really bad and really hurtful. And it's confusing. And I keep trying to find a word to describe the children of borderlines and narcissists and those who have more extreme disorders as they really affect our ability to be in relationship with our caregivers. Because as children, we often believe that if you don't see value in me as a parent or you can't meet my needs, even if it's because you have depression and you're just not able to be present for me or you're in unresolved trauma, I will often internalize that as being about me. So not only does it affect the actual caregiving interactions, but how I internalize and come to believe you know, what love looks like, what relationships look like, how I see myself and my value in the world, and as I keep saying, the core of so many of these issues is our sense of being worthless and not lovable, which really is, I think, the biggest problem with how these difficult childhoods affect our adult lives. So disorganized attachment is really a situation where we have a parent who often is struggling with being responsive. They're often unresponsive as a result of their own unresolved trauma, their own you know, difficulty in navigating consistency of self and other in terms of the world. And as a result of that, a parent who is often frightened and frightening. And so there's really a parent who is struggling with their own stability at times. And you can imagine that if you are a parent who has your own unresolved trauma or difficulty or, or some sort of genetic you know, brain um, uh, change or response to the way you sort of came out of the womb, that certain things are going to make life harder, especially parenting, given that parenting, I, as I keep saying, I really believe is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. And it's hard when kids are little because you're taking care of them, right? You're like a caretaker. But once you start actually parenting, you can also be deeply triggered and transported into your own childhood. And though I do believe that one of the best ways to heal your broken childhood, if you want 
want to be a parent is by being a different parent and the kind of parent, not perfectly, but the one you'd wish you'd had. But all that being said, no matter what, it's highly triggering. And so for parents who are struggling with disorders or mental health issues or unresolved trauma or brain difficulties, it's going to make showing up consistently and managing life difficult. So when we think about disorganized attachment, we're talking about the caregiver creating an attachment situation that creates disorganization in children. And so what does that look like? Let's talk about what it looks like from a disorganized mothering style. What does the research say? And I'm gonna use this book I use a lot for my attachment research. It is the Brown and Elliott book, um, Attachment Disturbances in Adults. And if you are not a clinician, I will say you might find this book to be a little too much, but you might visit the attachmentproject.com as they have created a website that really integrates the more clinical part and research part into material that you might find interesting and helpful. So this presentation though, we'll just talk about what disorganized mothering looks like. Now, as I said, one of the biggest issues is this contradiction in attachment behaviors. And so we have attachment that has no real um, organization or goal to it. It is chaotic. And so there's this direct disorganization of the attachment system, meaning that what I did yesterday to get needs met today by you might not be the same. Whereas when we look at like anxious and avoidant, we tend to get into patterns, right? I know that my caregiver, let's say, who's avoidant, doesn't like it when I'm super needy and emotional. So I'll play next to them with my toys to be close to them, but not necessarily reach out for them. I might learn to sort of become more autonomous. Or I know that with an anxious attachment caregiver, certain things are going to activate their anxiety. And so as a child, I sort of learn over time to modulate my responses. With disorganized attachment, it's all over the board. And not only that, but there's a, oftentimes a, an unresponsiveness. The child is not, their needs are not met because the parent is often struggling to meet their own needs. As I was saying, because of unresolved trauma or loss or because of their own dissociation, their own difficulties and things like that. So the research shows that oftentimes, as a result, the children of these parents often had prolonged separations from the caregiver, meaning that the caregiver was either not physically there or, or, or emotionally or, or mentally there. And oftentimes, because if you think about it, if you have a, a, a disorder in an extreme way, you may actually leave the home. You may become fearful and take off. You may have to pass on caregiving to other caregivers. These babies had mothers typically who have more difficulty with alcoholism and depression. And the mothers often have a pattern of both, as I said before, being frightened and frightening. So these oftentimes they're terrified and scared and or rageful and scary. We often see disorganized attachment moms having difficulty with, like I said, anger. So they can often be really loud and really aggressive and really dangerous, you know, mentally, physically, and emotionally. At other times, the parent is confused and tentative and not sure what to do and frightened, maybe being triggered by their own, you know, traumas or dissociations that make them scared or terrified. But the biggest problem with this, dis with this disorganized attachment is that the source of safety, which is supposed to be our attachment figure, is also the source of fear. And I just discussed that in this video, but this is a real dilemma. What do you do when the person who's supposed to keep you safe you also have to protect yourself from. And it's often referred to in the literature as fear without solution. You're terrified, you're afraid, you have to defend and respond, but there's no real solution for that. And so this push-pull is what I discussed in this dissociation video that can create difficulty for kids because they're trying to hold these two parts of their needs and their caregivers, and they are literally diametrically opposed, right? If you can't keep, if you're supposed to keep me safe, but also you're the person that hurts me on some level, I'm really struggling uh, on many psychological and physical um and really physical levels as well about what to do about that. So there's always this moving toward and away from in terms of the caregiving and the responsiveness. And it was found that maternal dissociation was much higher for those caregivers who struggle with disorganized attachment behaviors. And these unresolved states of mind and, and, and problems often create this dissociation like I just talked about, right? So you can imagine if you're trying to navigate all of that 
and then try to also parent a needy child, that can be really overwhelming. So as a result, the parent is often so into their own status in terms of managing themselves, or states, I guess is a better word, that they are not able to attune or attune very well or consistently. And remember, attunement is about, I see you, I feel you, I get you, I can be present and validate you and give you what you need. And so a caregiver that struggles with attunement is going to have a significant impact upon a child's sense of internalizing their well-being and who they are and, and their place in the world. Now, it also says that moms with disorganized attachment have more intrusive and negative communications with their child. And so a lot more negative interactions and intrusion, meaning getting into their psychic or physical space or emotional space. So not really good boundaries there oftentimes. They can be aggressive and hostile and sometimes act helpless and confused towards their own infants. And that often happens in, um, in anxious attachment where the child becomes the parent's caregiver or is overly involved in the caregiver's state of mind. That's also very common with disorganized attachment. That's where your parent is like, you know, making you their best friend and telling you too much about their life and asking you for solutions and help. I've seen a lot of cases where parents were asking, you know, their 11, 12 year old children, well, what should I do about this situation? Or dad or the divorce or my job. I mean, it's just too much of a burden for kids. And I will keep saying it, but it is not healthy for you to call your child your best friend. It is too much of a burden. Even if you have no mental health issues, you need to know that on some level, that is a massive burden for a child who can who needs you to be mother. Now, when you grow up and you wanna be best friends and you talk about everything, there's probably some stuff there, but that's way healthier. You're choosing as adults, assuming you're both generally healthy mentally, right? But to grow up always feeling as if you are responsible for your caregiver, especially if your caregiver was unstable, unresponsive, disorganized, and or just generally not able to access their adult selves, that places the burden on you to be the adult well before you are emotionally ready or able to do so. And at the, at the later stages of life, when your parents are elderly and they're maybe declining and you're becoming more and more the adult, that's very different than being the adult at you know, 10, 11, 12, 14 years old. So it says that these parental failures result in a child's inability to maintain closeness, safety, comfort, security, and connection to the caregiver because the caregiver makes sense, can't provide those things. And so these babies often have a greater negative emotional arousal. And so they're often struggling with their own capacity for self-regulation, right? How do I meet my own needs when my caregiver can't meet their own needs? There's not a lot of self-soothing in a healthy way learned. And so the babies are often left in this helpless, chronic state of frustration themselves. And that creates more negative affect states because if you think about it, you know, nothing's worse when you have a screaming, chi uh, screaming crying baby and a parent who can't handle it, which let's be honest, we've all felt at times. But if that happens again and again and again, you're both left in states of helplessness, except for the adult technically has more resources, but a baby or child has is really none. We also can see inhibited play for kids of these kind of moms. And I'm saying moms, but it can be whoever the main primary source is. And that sometimes we can see aggressiveness and explosiveness and helplessness in the children themselves too, right? Because they really are out of control. There's no one to contain them. The idea of attunement is we actually contain and hold. I can hold it. I got it. I got you. I can hold your emotion. I can hold your physical self and your needs, but when your caregiver can't do that, you're going to be feeling chaotic as a child as well. And so that can really manifest in marked difficulty with developing a sense of self and self-regulation, which as you grow into an adult, if you have a caregiver who struggled like that, that's why I talk a lot about on this channel, you're going to have a lot of your own issues oftentimes with mental health issues, which can manifest in CPTSD and you know not only chronic mental health issues, but physical health issues and relationship issues, and certainly a sense of self and worthiness that can be hard to, uh, that can be hard to manage. So the bottom line is that this concept of the source of safety was also the source of fear, the idea of the unresponsiveness and frightened and frightening states, and the really internalization of, of not being responded to and not being attuned to and not being held and contained psychologically, physically, and emotionally has really significant impacts on our adult lives. And so let's say there's a... Um, 
genetic predisposition for borderline yourself, right? Then you have a borderline parent who, who struggles, especially untreated with this idea of disorganized attachment. It's much more likely you're going to struggle at a minimum with your own self-regulation and sense of self, like I'm saying, and relationships and things like that. And so I think that oftentimes we don't realize, though, that these parents who are struggling with whatever the disorder is, are, are doing their best. It's just not enough at times for kids. And so that's been my goal on this channel to help people understand that it wasn't their fault, that there is often a reason for their parents' struggle, not necessarily to make it okay because oftentimes they're still in difficult relationships, but to begin to separate the fact that the caregiver had these issues and it doesn't have a reflection upon my value and to know that you are worthy of the work and the healing. So I hope this was helpful. Please feel free to post your thoughts and questions or what you want down below. And I'm gonna make a video on this, but I'm gonna be asking for your help. I want to create a course, a full-on course specifically for children of borderlines separately and children of narcissists separately and other disorders because I truly believe that it is a very unseen population. And I have been getting the most incredible emails and requests for therapy, but because I can't see patients outside of the state of California, and because I really think that it would be incredible to have a resource, I'm curious to hear what you might want in a course. If you were going to buy a course that had a lot of things covered as a result of a childhood like this, what would it be? I'm thinking it would include a lot of things I've discussed, plus a lot more on understanding yourself, the parent, and tools. Tools, kind of like I'm discussing a bit in the shame journal, but much more targeted towards all the areas of borderline. But I'm really curious, for example, if you were gonna do a course to help work on those issues, what would they be? And what components would it have and things like that? Knowing that it can't be therapy, but it will be very therapy, research and psychology related and targeted towards you as the you know young adult and adult child. So please feel free to share your thoughts. I wanna start building the course if I can find the time. You probably noticed I'm struggling at times to get videos out on time because I am blessed to work full time and it is frankly a lot. But I would like to create a situation where I can see a few less patients and spend more time building free YouTube videos and also more in-depth courses. But I'm very curious to see what you think and what your thoughts are so I can create stuff that you guys would find helpful. So thanks for watching. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you next time. Bye.